All right, so here we are. Hey everyone, this is James Wilson with MTV Stream Training Systems and BikeJames.com, and welcome to another Bike James podcast. This uh, podcast, I have the opportunity to interview strength coach extraordinaire Dan John. Coach, how's it going? Really well. We just had our morning workout and had breakfast, and then uh, I rushed up here and got my water so I can have an an intelligent conversation with you. On Perfect. Home. Yes, sir. On uh, 100 water. Three, three day, yes. Uh, working yes. out. Yeah. It's it warm in our neck of the woods. So, um, yeah, how's the, uh, the the home gym going? So you're you're working out at your home gym, and then if you, are you, do you still have a, a trainer that you're working with as well uh, no, a couple I, days a week? The problem is, you know, because of uh, social distancing, I, I took a, a leap. But, okay. Uh, but now we train, you know, Mike and I are just going to train five days a week. Uh, uh, and we get some guests. Uh, we're pretty good about social distancing. We're pretty good about masks. We're very good about everything. If we have, if anybody is a former cancer, you know, of course, uh, a couple of our members have already had it. So we kind of feel like we're doing, we're doing what we can, uh, but we still got to work out. And, you know, yeah. I mean, I, I can't. I mean, I'm making the best progress I've made in decades, so I, I don't want to curtail anything, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, that's uh, that's awesome. So, again, just uh, for people who don't know, uh, Coach Dan John is a, a strength coach who's worked with athletes in uh, countless sports, um, really done a lot of work with high school athletes, which is some of my favorite uh, work of yours, um, you know, special forces, emergency responders, a lot of people who's performance as coach puts it when the lights are on and it's time to perform uh people come to dan john to figure out what's the missing link what am i missing to help me get to that next level and uh one of the things that i really like about uh coach is that he is a demystifier in an industry where everybody likes to overcomplicate things he has a way of explaining things where you're like oh yeah well duh uh, that makes sense. Of course, there's difference between understanding it and following it. Um, but I'm really excited to get Coach on because he's been a huge influence on me and my uh, training philosophies ever since the old T Nation days. Uh, I've been reading his uh, his books. He's got a new one out um, uh, called Attempts. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, sorry, I was going blank about halfway through it there. And uh, yeah, just a, a wealth of information, but particularly one of the things I wanted to get him on for was because he was one of the people who really started to open my eyes to the difference between training for fitness and training for health. And so, uh, yeah, that really changed the course of a lot of things that I'm doing with my, uh, and so I wanted to get him on and, and get his view on this and, and just kind of, uh, yeah, pick his brain on it. So, um, yeah, so coach, can welcome. And yeah, just kind of starting there. What, I guess, when did you start realizing that there was a difference between training for fitness and training for health and that you, you might need to start reevaluating, you know, what your yeah. goals are uh, sure. based on that? You know, as a kid, the, the magazine that everyone read was called Strength and Health. And it's kind of nice because that the phrase strength and health is still kind of not bad. Uh, I want to, you know, I want to train for strength and health. But what happens, and it always happens, is that as time moves on, uh, when cardiovascular system uh, training really moved from basically track and field to this thing they called aerobics, uh, an invented term. A guy made up the name for a book, uh, and the book's called Aerobics. And then, of course, Bowerman came out with this jogging book. Well, now, boy, is there cardiovascular, and now there's strength, and then power. And all of a sudden, things started to break up into these chunks, and all these chunks started their own little migration and the, and all it did was make for a lot of confusion so i tried my help my best a few years ago to break it out as best i can and we're going to leave one of the terms to the side just for a few seconds but i health is i use matthew Tone's definition the optimal interplay of the human organs i mean if you know if your blood pressure numbers are good you don't have cancer you don't have any disease that's going to punch you in the face, uh, if your dental health is good, you don't have any issues with your eyes, your blood profiles are good, well, then we can kind of say you're healthy. Now, someone's going to raise their hand and say, well, how fast of a mile should you run? 
That's not, don't, shish. Because that's, that's something else. But people always want this other number. It's like, well, listen, if your blood pressure is 500 over 300 and you can run a five minute mile, good for you, but you're a ticking time bomb. Or, you know, you win, you win a triathlon, but you got some cancer floating around in your body, big one that you don't know about. You, you, good for you, you ran a triathlon, did the triathlon, but you're not healthy. The next phrase, let's go, let's go in this order, is longevity. And there's a quantity and quality issue there. From what I've seen, the best thing you do is have grandparents and parents who've lived a long, long time. Uh, DNA is certainly probably 50%. Uh, my wife's family, uh, both sides, the Hemingways and the Drury's, I mean, these people don't die. I mean, uh, her grandmother died a couple of years ago at 102. Uh, my family, my grandmother died 1925. So in five years, it'll be the 100th anniversary of my grandmother's death. So my family, we don't live long at all, but there's two issues here. So that's the quantity, there's the quality. And, I, and for me, when we talk about longevity, it's the quality that I'd like to focus on. And that is when taking good care of your health when you're your age, young, and take, wear your seatbelt, you know, do those kinds of, don't smoke, tr you know, floss your teeth, all those little things that add up, pay big dividends when you're in your 60s, 70s, and 80s, 90s, and 100s. And then the third word is the one that most people get screwed up on. That's fitness. And that's the ability to do a task. And the, there's a difference between fitness and performance. Fitness is you decide, is there a bike trail near your house? That's a pretty tough one. Is there a bike trail? Uh, oh yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's, there's, yeah, there's a, there's a race here every year. The, the grand junction 50 that a lot of riders you okay. know, kind of put on the calendar is like, this is what we're going to do train for. You, if you jump on your bike today by yourself and finish it, that is a fitness performance. If you do it with 2,000 other racers, that's a performance, okay? Because they called your name, you stepped up, and many people mistake those two. So fitness is the ability to do a task. Performance is when someone says your name and you step up. And I'm much more of a performance coach. So with performance, like for example, if you get a flat tire within the first 50 meters of this thing, this, you decide to do it, and you say, ah, what the hell, and you throw your bike in the back of your pickup and go home, no one in the world, you don't get a, what, a DNF. You just, you go home, repair the bike, and say, I'll do it some other time. Performance, now that's different. That means you're scrambling to fill, you know, you're doing everything you can to get back in the race, right? Yep. And then the fifth one, which I always try to ignore, but this is the most common question, that's fat loss. And I, and I don't even, I, it's funny because if I write something on fat loss, I get 15,000 views uh, if, it's a, uh, if it's a video and you know, it gets shared by everybody. Fat loss is losing fat. And I agree with Devaney who said, don't get fat in the first place um, because it's so much easier Good to not plan. get fat than it is to undo that. So the reason I wanted to break that out for you, bike, uh, uh, the bike chains, not to call you bike chains. No, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, no. That's what people call me. No problem. <laughs> yeah. uh, gentle listener, I often reference people to James. And, uh, and on podcasts and stuff, I call them bike chains. Bike chains are not coming. But uh, <laughs> so, so what I try to, what I like to do is make sure there is at least some level of clarity there before we get started. Now, to be an elite performer, you may endanger your health for short periods of time. Um, one time for a weightlifting meet, I went from 273 to 242 in just a few days. Now, was that the healthiest thing I ever done in my life? Well, no, but I had to weigh 110 kilos to compete. Not 110.1, but 110. So I did this thing. And sometimes I'm sure that the health benefits of mountain biking are put into question when you're laying by the side of a rock, bleeding out a little bit, right? <laughs> so yeah, yeah, those, yeah, those moments, yeah. Yeah, so it's a, mountain biking is a really health, it's good for your health until crash and burn, and it's not so good for your health. So you right. gotta make sure if you can keep those things kind of separate a little bit, but then what you begin to do is once you separate them and define them, then you can see how they interweave with each other. So taking care of your health for 50 or 60 years pays dividends on your longevity. Maybe not the quantity, because a lot of that's just DNA. 
and luck. My coaches tell me t- the longevity is 10% luck, you know, uh, not getting hit by the car, not go- being drafted and going to the war, not, you know, some other, you know, <laughs> not being on the plane that crashes, you know. Um, there is a bit of luck in there. And when you start looking at fitness goals, I know people whose fitness goals interfere with their health and longevity. Uh, because yeah. they, they, I always joke, not only do they burn the candle at both ends, they take a blowtorch up the middle. Uh, so performance, so yes, your health, I mean, if you want to be a great master's athlete, I would tell you to be as healthy as you can in your teen years, your 20s, your 30s, your 40s, because when you show up to master's competition and you're a healthy specimen, you're kind of, you've got a notch on some of your competition. Uh, so I hope you can see how they all dance together, but it is important when teaching that you separate them out of it. Yeah, no, I think that's super important. It also goes to something that you talk about a lot is, is that, you know, well, what do you mean by that? When someone comes to you and says like, I want to, you know, do something, you know, I want to get fitter or I want to ride faster or whatever, or whatever. It's like, well, what do you mean by that? You know, and dig a little deeper and kind of find out, well, what, what exactly are they looking for? And then helping them understand. Um, again, another thing, the, the, your, uh, the, the book I was reading yesterday, you were talking about the, the agony of achieving a goal. And I was like, that is so awesome because especially as we get older, that's something that we don't really take into account when you're younger. It, it's a different mindset. Everything's totally different when you're in your twenties and you're indestructible and you're not married and you got no responsibilities and you know, the, the, those things are different, but then you get older, you got kids, you've got these responsibilities, you got a, a body that's got all this wear and tear from, uh, you know, doing all these fun things with it. And now all of a sudden you're like, Oh, I want to achieve these goals. And, but sometimes there's agony of achieving that goal that we don't take into account. And some of those things relate back to the health and the longevity and stuff. And so anyways, yeah, I don't, uh, that, that's great. If you want to kind of touch on some of those things. Let me explain that to your, to your listeners. Um, basically it comes down, it's a quadrant. It's a little chart we fill in and on the top you put pain, pleasure. And on the side is making the goal, not making the goal. And I, and I, so here's the thing. Everybody thinks that I will have a ton of pleasure if I make my goal. And I, We'll start with that one because that's, and the funny thing is when I work with athletes, I'll say, what pleasure will you get by making the Olympic team or winning the nationals? Ah, it'd be great. So I don't think that's enough to keep you going. Uh, If you lose those 50 pounds of body fat, what would be the pleasure in it? Uh, It'll be great. Well, and one of the things I try to do is I try to ramp that up. So not only will you look good in your swimsuit, you'll strut in your swimsuit. That's a quote right out of the book. it is true. Sometimes I'll be sitting around and I'll pick up a trophy or a cup or a medal of something from 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. My first uh, trophy is from 1967, a year before my wife was born. I'll pick that up and I'll look at it and there's this little, yeah, I did that. So for me, I try to really build up, make it even better. Okay. And then the obvious, the other, what is the pain you will get from not achieving your goal? And that's, that's an easy one. Uh, oh, I'll, I'll just feel like a failure. My ex-girlfriend will be right. Uh, my, you know, uh, my heart. Will, okay, fine. The other two are the ones I think are more important. What is the pleasure in not getting your goal? And people are like, wait, what are you talking about? Well, here's the deal, folks. The bulk of the people who try to lose weight on January 1st, the resolution fail miserably. So there must be some pleasure in not doing a diet and exercise program. Uh, no, I'm telling you. Well, what's, Dan, well, I'll do anything. I hate myself. Then why do you keep coming back to those junk foods, those cakes, those desserts, not showing up at the gym or not doing your daily walk? What is it? Which, that hour of walking has been replaced by watching Netflix. Well, wh- why? Well, Netflix is more fun than that hour of walk. There's more pleasure in not attaining. And when I go through this one, James, it's weird. With, with, a, with, with someone I'm working with, because it's like, they'll, they'll just kind of go, well, that's not true. I, I, the, that, and then all of a sudden they'll kind of catch themselves and be like, yeah, you know, it's funny you say that. It is a lot more fun to watch Caddyshack than it is to do uh, 
hill sprints. Yeah, isn't that funny? It's a lot more fun to eat uh, ice cream out of the tub than it is to chop up peppers, onions, and saute them. It's weird how that is, isn't it? Yeah. And then, of course, the one that really throws people off, what's the pain in achieving your goal as well? I know this. If you want to, the, the number one person who screws up most clients' efforts is the spouse. Uh, and talk to any personal trainer, they'll say it's weird. Oh, so if I hire James, you know, James goes home uh, to uh, the lovely Edna. And I say, uh, James, I want to eat vegetables and everything. Oh, switch it. It's better if I switch it. So uh, James, I'm training Edna, the love of your life. And, uh, and I say, Edna, I want you to eat vegetables at every meal. And you go home and start, you know, chopping vegetables for breakfast. You, James will walk in and go, uh, why are you chopping vegetables? Well, Dan says I should have vegetables every meal. Oh. So if Dan said, would you jump off the Golden Gate Bridge? Would you do it? Well, no, but vegetables sounded, oh, so Dan said this. And very often, there's a lot of pain in achieving your goals. Uh, you know, if you want your wife to uh, get in the best shape of her life, all of a sudden, people are going to look at your wife more. Uh, if you decide you want to be on an Olympic team, there's going to be sack. You're not going to be able to go to a lot of parties. In the book, I joke about, I think I'm the only adult in the 1970s to have never gone to a disco. I never went to a disco, not one time. Yeah, you, you were training. For people that don't know, you you were a uh, national champion uh, discus thrower. Not correct? at the time, but later, yeah. Not but I yeah, was a, yeah. a very, very good thrower. And, you know, and I felt that um, my nightlife should be sleeping. And, uh, well, I did carbo load on cores. Uh, I will say that I did use some serious carbo load on cores. But, uh, you know, it's hard. So when you break it down like this, what, what, what I'm trying to do by talking about the pain and pleasure of both getting and not getting your goals is so the person begins to see their own personal roadmap, not the future, but the one they had in the past. Everybody, almost everybody has goals. I mean, um, I mean, some are easier than others, you know, you know, graduating kindergarten is slightly easier than some other goals like throwing the discus over 200, but Everybody has been in the process of goal setting, and many people go, you know what, you're funny, you said that. Uh, I wanted to start my own rock band, but then I had to learn how to do an instrument. And I'd much rather just, you know, act like I was in a rock band, grow my hair out and smoke dope and hang out with my groupies. Uh, but the effort of learning how to play the guitar, you know, it just wasn't there for me. So that's a, that's a major lesson in my life. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, I, I think that's something that, um, like I said, especially for, you know, me as I got older and my priorities changed, you know, how there started to be more agony involved with achieving some of my goals yeah. and uh, making, uh, just understanding that friction and making peace with it is kind of part of that process of, of, of uh, moving forward, I guess, as, a, as an older athlete. Um, and so, yeah, I guess, you know, I, I, I'd say like, that's one of the, um, big mistakes. I mean, do you kind of see some other, uh, major mistakes or things that older athletes make, uh, you know, with their training or how they approach, uh, their sport, um, you know, w with this kind of idea in mind of, you know, longevity and health and, and all that versus fitness? Well, you know, I I think it's a well overquoted thing, but uh, in the martial arts tradition, you know, at first a kick is a kick, and later, and then of course, when you stand long enough, a kick becomes a kick again. You know, when we talk about how to be a great discus thrower, Coach Mon told me, you know, you lift three days a week and you throw four days a week, you know, for the next eight years. And the problem is, well, I want the fast track. Well, eight years later, after all the injuries and all the stupid stuff you do, you sit down one day and you start lifting three days a week and throwing four days a week and miraculously you get better. And it's like, you know, I knew this in the beginning. Yeah. Very often every sport, every discipline has this very fundamental, very basic, very boring, like little list of things you need to do, but it's never sexy enough. It's never groovy enough. You know, um, you know, you, and, I would say the hardest lesson 
But, and it goes right back to Devaney's point of don't get fat in the first place. The best fat system I know is to stay, <laughs> of course, I used to say I, going into college, but now I realize that it, we're, our obesity epidemic is more middle school. But if you can stay lean in middle school, lean in high school, don't put on that freshman 40, please. Pizza, folks, pizza and beer is not optimal, okay? Every day for three meals a day. Um, and you can stay lean in your 20s. It's like the magic happens, man. You know, you just don't, hang on this thing, I got to, oh, yeah, no worries. Okay, sorry. Uh, my phone is always going. But if you can, if you can hold back on getting as fat as you possibly can at 21, you're going to be fine. And you, you, you tell that to people, and it's like, yeah, yeah. But I did get fat, so what do I got to do? Uh, can, can you give me a two-week program? It's like, oh my god, it took you four decades to get here. Can I have like four weeks to get back to you? You know. So it is. Yeah. It's frustrating, but it is. A part of not only, I wouldn't say human nature, but American nature, that I want the secret, I want the quick loss, I want the quick thing. And the truth is, there are no secrets, and the fastest route is the slowest route. Yeah, yeah, no, I uh, I, I totally agree. That's actually one of the the um, things that I got from doing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I've been doing that for the last almost eight years, uh, and. I've got a lot of really good insights from that that have helped me with mountain bike training. And one of the things that I love about Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is it takes 10 plus years to become a black belt. And right. so the first day you step on the mat, they're telling you like, Hey man, just relax. You got 10 years. And even then that's not the end of the journey, right? It's the complete opposite of like how the fitness industry approaches things. We got six weeks to whip your ass into shape, you know, versus like, Hey man, just relax, enjoy the process. Cause they understand like, if you're not here in 10 years, you can't get that black belt. So if we destroy your, you know, your confidence and, and stuff in the, in the beginning, trying to get a lot out of you as a white belt, then you're never going to make the black belt. And so I see this in, in mountain biking, people come in and they're like, man, if, if you're not, you know, one of the top riders in your riding group in the first six months, like, something's wrong and you need a new bike and you know, some blah, blah, blah. And it's like, Holy crap, you've been riding for six months. You're supposed to suck. Like, it's fine. Just relax. So yeah, I think that that's, uh, um, that, that's a, that's a big lesson uh, for people just in, in all areas of, of life is that there are no quick fixes. Like there is no fast track to being a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt because you, the, the black belt is on the mat. Like if, eventually you're going to have to slap hands. It's not all katas and breaking boards and stuff like that. Like you're going to have to slap hands with another black belt and you're going to have to show like, man, yeah, you got the skills. So there are no shortcuts to that point. You know, you can get hacks to look like you're, you know, doing other things better, but that's one of the beautiful things about jujitsu, man, about grappling in particular is it's such a, a pure a track and field is the same thing. It's such a pure, oh, yeah. uh, you know, thing. It's so unfuzzy. Right. And so, uh, yeah, but that's, um, like I said, man, that, that's, that's one of the, 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 the uh, big lessons for me that I've gotten from jujitsu that I've tried to, you know, help instill in the mountain biking world as well as like, Hey man, just relax. It's part of the process. You know, there are no quick fixes. You know, you, you, you have to learn how those, those three things, right. You talk about, you know, in, in mountain biking, it's, uh, it's cornering, it's standing pedaling, especially on, on climbs. And then it is your, your high tension cardio, your ability to recover quickly from a hard effort. And these things this just take that? time. Just, yeah. Just real quick, uh, listener. Um, I have this theory that I always ask people, what are the three keys to performance? And James was kind enough to share that with us years ago, I think now, about what are the three keys to mountain biking? And when you break things down to just the three, you, now there's all that other stuff and you need to learn it. But if you focus on those pillars, good things happen. Uh, it's, it's, it's honestly simple. I don't know. Did you get a chance to read the new book by any chance? I'm about uh, halfway through it. Okay. At, at, the, the end book, at, the, at the end of the book, my daughter, Lindsay, does the about the author thing. And she said okay. something that really resonated with what you said. Uh, if you fail miserably at a track meet, I don't give you a long speech if you're angry. 
I tell you this sentence. Are you ready? You're not good enough to be frustrated. Now, if you've been throwing eight years, 15,000 throws a year, and your fingers have bled because your finger, throwing fingers have bled because you threw so much, and then you had to tape them up and throw some more, and then you've gotten not only sunburn, but frostbit training, you've walked around with trench foot because you're so much mud is in your shoes, then if you throw a big throw out of bounds, then you can drop the F-bomb and make a show. I'm fine then. I don't want to hear it after three weeks. I don't want to hear that you're right. fucked after three weeks, man. Uh, three years, I'll allow you a little bit of swearing. Twelve years, I'll allow a lot of swearing. <laughs> you're not good enough to be frustrated. Yes. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a good good point. It's funny how those things line up, man, like the, the that 10-year mark and just the – because now in jiu-jitsu, I think about things like three, four years, you're a purple belt. You know, and same thing in jiu-jitsu. Like, that's about the same time when it's like, all right, now we're expecting something out of you. Like, you can, you know, complain a little bit. But before that, like, you're a white belt, you're a blue belt. It's like, dude, just shut up and get the reps in. Like, there's so many reps between now and figuring it out. Just shut up and get them out of the way uh, sort of thing. Everyone wants to overanalyze everything, and it's like, I got to be perfect right off the bat. And it's like, no, just take that pressure off of you. It's all, you know, societal and in your head and stuff that that's uh, – um, you know, different, but that's, that's one of the things I like about, you know, your stuff is that you, you look at strength training from such a philosophical, uh, standpoint. I mean, you've got a pretty unique background. I mean, you're, you're a religious studies scholar. Um, you know, you spent some time in the Middle East as a, as a road scholar. Yeah. Fulbright, my God. the road Fulbright, scholar. I'm sorry, man. They, Listen, they, I'm not smart enough to know the difference. Okay. It's an insult to me, not smart. to you or them. Yeah. So I, I apologize. That is the, the fact that, that, you know, they let people like me even know that those things exist is, uh, is, is kind yeah. of them. But anyways, uh, so yeah, but the, um, yeah, that, that philosophical background that you bring to the strength training stuff is something that, that I, I really enjoy. I, I guess like, yeah, if you wouldn't mind just kind of talking about that a little bit and just kind of some of the, the I don't know, is it, what, what are some of the kind of the top lessons or, or takeaways that you've gotten from these other areas for strength training? You know, Aristotle had a sign on his wall of his academy. If you don't understand geometry, don't come in. I honestly think that geometry is probably the most important thing you could study as a strength coach or as a track and field coach. Now, because so many of the things are proofs. Here are your givens. Here's what you need to prove. And there's deductive and inductive logic. So... One of the, like I've got this new website, Dan John University, and the very first thing we ask you on the workout generator is, what equipment do you have? Now, that sounds pretty simple, right? And yet, I'll look at programs people send me, and there's a need for, I have probably one of the best home, equipped home gyms in the world. You know, I got three Olympic bars, 26 kettlebells, every farmer carry thing in the world. I mean, bags and farmer bars every Highland game implement, including a cable, every track and field implement, and many of them. I mean, I've got two different hip thrust machines. I've got, I got everything. So when I look at some of these workouts people send to their clients online, it's like, listen, I couldn't do that in my home gym. And I got the best home gym in the world ish, you know? So number one, what do you have? Number two, how much, how many days a week? Number three, how long do you want to go? So those are your givens. And if you say you want to work out five days a week and you have uh, a single 24 kilo kettlebell and a jump rope, well, okay. And you, okay, great. In fact, that's not bad. We can put together a pretty good workout. From, so there's your givens. And from there, where to go to the proof. And you said you want to get in maybe better shape or whatever, whatever it is, whatever that, but it's the givens first. And then we go from there. In theology, if you believe in one God, that's your given. And from there, issues come up. Like, for example, if a baby dies, you know, that why do bad things happen to good people? Well, if you believe in uh, 365 million gods, well, that's a much easier question to answer. One of the gods who doesn't like you got you. But you got to always start with the givens. So, so it's funny because in philosophy, geometry, theology, we always start with the givens. As a strength coach, 
I'm a big believer in the given. So let's review what I've worked with, we've discussed in the past. James is like, I asked you, what are the three keys to being a good mountain biker? And you said cornering, stand up, and what was the third one, I'm sorry? It's like your, your high tension cardio, that, that ability that to, weird, you know, yeah. Weird cardio that you guys have to have where you're pumping your legs and your upper body's holding basically a plank, right? Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. Those are the three big ones. Okay. I wouldn't want, okay. Oh, here's another one. Uh, do you have a bicycle? <laughs> Where do we go ahead on this? And I, I'm actually kind of serious here. I, I would not yes. be surprised if you have not had one or two people call, ask you who did not have a bike to ride. I, I wouldn't yeah, be I haven't had, I haven't had that, but I had a guy who wanted to be a downhill a mountain biking champion who lived in New York City. And I had to explain to him the logistical problems that come with that uh, goal versus location. But I, I know exactly what you mean. There's no, he didn't take his givens into account before he started looking at his goals. James, I had a guy email me not long ago. He, he goes, Dan, I want to do your big 21 program. So that's uh, clean and press, snatch, and clean and jerk, okay? Three days a week for three weeks, nine total workouts. And I go, and he goes, the only thing is I don't have an Olympic bar. So how, how you can he was so far away from the most basic of the givens, but he still want, he didn't have an Olympic bar and wanted to do three weeks of Olympic lifting. And, and he wanted to do it with the kettlebell, but you, you can't add one kilo to a kettlebell, you know? Right. And I don't even know what the exercises would be, you know? But that's a different workout. That's a different thing. Just, just do a kettlebell workout for God's sakes. So when we yeah. start, when we start there with this idea of givens, it's strange to say this out loud, but I just took you back to theology, philosophy, and geometry. So that's the way my head works. In fact, uh, my daughter thinks it's funny to mess with me, and my, my my buddy Jim always says that I have to always go back to in the beginning to answer any question. Uh, because I'm always, I'm always concerned that you're not understanding. Okay, how do we start today? I differentiate between health, fitness, longevity, performance, and then we tossed in fat loss just because everyone talked about. It. But I feel if we don't make sure we understand those clear, the clarity of how they're different, and then bring them back together, I feel like you're going to miss the basic points. So yeah, sometimes my performance has impacted my health in a negative way. Lots of my friends who got very good in performance are dead now because they chose to do certain things that would make them perform better, but it had a health and longevity consequence. So you can't say discus throwing kills you, but you can say that, yeah, so you follow what I'm trying to, you yeah. feel a dance with these kinds of things. Um, that's why I thought your isometric stuff with the, uh, the, the, the judo belt or the martial arts belt was such a good idea. I think mine cost, did it cost me $18 or something like that? Something um, like that, yeah. But not, I mean, really, really reasonable. But if I was going to do BMX racing and I, ha and I would want to invest my money in better bike, bike storage, bike carriers, right? Better uh, protective gear. Yep, yep. And then buy an $18 judo belt to get my strength workouts in. And then later get myself a kettlebell, later, whatever, wherever you head from there. Mm -hmm. uh, so, it, it, yes, uh, th that is where the, that is where I think where my religious studies and theology background helps. And it also helps me understand people just a little bit better. I'll just give the one, I usually talk about this one thing a lot, but uh, you know, a hundred years ago, there was a poem, Waken Lords and Ladies Gay, On the Mountain Dawns the Day. There's a song that says, Don we now are gay apparel. Well, a steno symbol is when a word or a concept has a single meaning. Well, in 2020, the word gay doesn't mean happy anymore like it used to. It has a different meaning now. Okay, there's, so hold on to that. In my world, when I say weightlift, I get single bicep uh, pose. I say, I'm gonna go in the gym, single bicep pose. If you ask my grandson, Danny, what does grandpa do in the weight room? He'll give you the single bicep pose. So the stano symbol right now, weightlifting is bodybuilding. So with my background in theology, religious studies, religious education, 
I was able to come up with an ability to say that to people and they go, well, no, I'm a, I'm a high jumper. Okay, then why are you doing curls? Because according to Newton, uh, building that upper body, it's going to actually, you know, it's action reaction. Uh, you have more added mass. I don't know if it's going to take a centimeter off or not, but if it comes down to a centimeter, you know, you got the big guns, you didn't jump any higher. So, but they want to look good. And that's why an interesting thing, I never program for men bench press or arm work because I know they're always with it. And for females, I never program flexibility or ab work because I know they will do it. And so, so having that word steno symbol from theology really cleared up my ability to teach weightlifting and its appropriate role in sports and fat loss and everything else. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's strange to say that, uh, but it, uh, I read interesting things yesterday about Steve Jobs took a calligraphy class. And it was because of the calligraphy class that he learned about balance. And that's why you don't, after a sentence, you don't go. So if you type after a period, you go space, space. Well, because he took a calligraphy class, he decided to have the, so you know how computers now, you don't need it in spaces correctly. Yeah. He decided to have so many more fonts. It all comes from Steve Jobs taking a calligraphy class. And it makes the work we do now, I mean, I mean, when I, when I was young, one of my neighbors uh, worked at a, uh, a newspaper. And he was the guy who put the letters into print. Mm -hmm. And he was a master at spacing out words so they fit in the columns. Well, that's a job that doesn't exist anymore. Why? Because Steve Jobs took a calligraphy class. Huh, yeah. So yeah. My, my, I hope you're myth making my point. My point is yeah. sometimes it's the best thing you can do, gentle listener and James, is get outside your magic little box and you'll be shocked how taking a class over here or studying this over there completely changes the way you approach what you're, what you're passionate about. Yeah. Like you don't even know what you don't even know. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I'm a huge believer in that. Like I mentioned before, the how jujitsu has influenced my understanding of uh, pressure and angles and how they apply to mountain biking. Uh, there's a book called uh, Where Good Ideas Come From, and they talk about this uh, concept called the adjacent possible. And it's basically where, like, you know, you get all these different insights and experiences and skills and you, like you're saying, like they don't all, you don't want them all in one area, right? And so eventually you get this unique view of the world that only you have, right? Like I would say like no one else has Dan John's view of the world. Like you have a very unique view of the world and of strength training. And it's all because of these different experiences and things that you had. But then that's what gives you the ability to, you know, connect with people and, and, and have these insights. Because you, you, you're standing at this adjacent possible peering over the edge of like, what's, what's, what's next? What's possible? You know, what's the next possible thing in strength training or how I explain this or how, where this evolves. And so, you know, that's, uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a huge believer in that. And that's one of the reasons I enjoy your work so much because I can tell like you have such a unique view of the world because you do have all these different insights that Wait, come into share, it. Let me share a new experience for you. It's kind of odd. But for years, I thought one of the most important things uh, an American football coach could do was first learn tic-tac-toe and then study like strategy and tactics. There's a great course on great courses <laughs> sorry, uh, called strategy and tactics and then learn the game of chess. Well, here's the funny thing. Tic-tac-toe, I still agree with that. Studying strategy and tactics. But now with the modern game, chess doesn't work anymore. But you know mm -hmm. what does? The game Connect Four. Mm. You know the game Connect Four? The oh, game yeah. Connect Four, all of a sudden, your opponent will drop this, the, the, the chip or whatever, you know, whatever it is. And you'll yeah. look and you'll see that there was, they got four in a row. And you'll think, how did I miss that? How did I miss that? So you play another game and you begin to see this bigger pattern. What I like about the game Connect Four is, Every time a chip drops, 
unless you're playing someone who's just terrible. I mean, just, you know, going out of the way to be stupid. Every time a chip drops, the dynamics of the game changes, which is exactly the way American football has evolved since they've uh, modified the offensive pass rules and really hamstrung the defenders. And I said that to a couple coaches, and they're, at first they were like, my kids play connect four. And I said, I'm going to tell you something. I want you to just play a couple of games and lose. And when you lose, I want you to sit back and go, how did I miss that? And then I followed up and said, how often have you been in a game and you forgot to teach something? And then you say to yourself, how did I miss that? Because when you go back and you look at the film of the game, you're like, oh, it's so obvious. And that's why I think Connect Four is such a delightful way to teach strategy and tactics to American football coaches. And mm -hmm. what it, so it's a, a, no one gets hurt, no one gets punched in the mouth, there's no offensive and defensive penalties, no one gets heat stroke or heat exhaustion. Fairly safe practice, okay? Um, but the idea, what, what I'm trying to get across is, this is my vision of how I do things. I was playing Connect Four with my grandson, Danny, and he beat me and I went, how did I miss that? And then it caught, took me back to coaching. This is a long time. This be in the mid eighties. And what made me a better American football coach is that it was when I realized that we were, you know, we were missing situational plays. We weren't practicing. We were just running. We we're just running plays. We weren't doing things in the real world, like third and fifteen. Running in a practice, running a third and 15 play is radically different than just running a bunch of plays in a row. Yeah, you, and, and, and so I began, I began to become a much better coach. Uh, and I, I'll still use the word the chess match of football, but now it's more the connect fourness of it. Is my goal was to get rid of all those, how did I miss that points? And I began to, at the time, I wish I had kept them. I had all these, uh, you, you young kids wouldn't even know what I'm talking about. So I had these manila folders, okay? And on the manila folder, I just would write in situations. Like on the kickoff, uh, there might have been, nowadays I would have it laminated too. Um, so you could use them, but you, there's probably 10, man, 10 would be a reach, 10 kickoff scenarios, okay? Uh, James goes to kick the ball, hits the top of it, and it only goes six yards, okay? That's a live ball. We can't touch it. They can. If they touch it, we get a chance to recover it. Now, that might only happen once every three or four years, but if we practice it, we're ahead of you. And because how did I miss that? Well, we're not going to miss it because I'm going to give the special teams coach this folder. And on, you know, on the first time we practice it, we're going to practice – maybe three scenarios, next time another three scenarios, next time another three or four, and then just rotate those practices. We're not just going to kick the ball off perfectly every time and do a kickoff. We're going to do all the weird things that can happen. And that, that, is, a, that is a great insight in the coaching of any team sport or any strategy sport. For example, you know, in your world of, of, of racing, do you have to pass people? Yeah, there's some uh, disciplines where you're, yeah, you got to deal with passing people for sure. How often do you practice? Exactly. <laughs> you know what I like? Here's, here's uh, in, in, enduro racing is real popular. So enduro racing is where it could be a, a two-day thing and you'll, you'll ride to a point and then you get time from point A to point B. And then you ride to another point and you get time from point A to point B and you'll do like, three to five of those one day, and then you'll do more the next day. And you're only, you're only scored on how fast you went from point A to point B. And then you add up those different points. So your, your transfer time, as they call it, between stages isn't timed. You know, it doesn't matter how fast you go. But then you talk to people and you're like, hey, how do you train for an enduro race? Well, I just go out and ride hard. It's like, that doesn't sound like an enduro race to me at all, you know? So yeah, I know exactly what you mean. So if, if passing people is an important part of your sport, you need to practice passing people. You know, yeah. if, you're, you know if, if, if I become a track and field coach and it seems like that every couple of years, I say I swear I'll never do it again, but one of the things I'll do with my athletes, especially 
plus 400 meters is have them practice getting boxed in, practice coming around the pack and accelerating, practice these things that you can, why do you have to wait until the state championship to learn how to get out of a box? You know, no, that should be, you know, um, that's why with discus throwers, any thrower actually, we often practice what we call a one throw competition. Sometimes you foul your first two throws and now your career rests on one throw. Well, if all you do when that happens is pee down in your pants, that's not the most effective way to become an elite thrower. But if I practice week in, week out, we do that one throw competition, uh, we practice aiming, we practice all kinds of things. When the pressure of that situation will hit you, you have a, a system prep for it. Uh, I had an athlete, it, it certainly was far more gifted than any athlete ever had, really could have been a much better, but he got down to two throws in the state championship with fouls. And then on his third throw, the only fair throw he got, he threw a personal record. Well, I mean, that's just money in the bank, you know, that, but because we had trained that situation. So yes, you're right. So it comes down to cornering. It comes down to uh, tall pedaling and it comes down to that weird kind of cardio you guys have, but you also have to practice cutting inside somebody, going around somebody, you know, uh, being in a pack, right? There's times you're in a pack uh, and somebody breaks funny and you got, you got to practice that stuff and maybe yeah. you practice it. And maybe the workout one day is, you know, you ask a buddy to just go in front of you down the hill and you practice going around guiding the hill, have him go in an absolute straight line, just get used to it. You know, I, I don't know what I'm talking about by uh, James. I, I honestly don't. But I know. Yeah. That. Yeah. No. 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 You're absolutely right. It's 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 understanding the situations that you have to deal with when it's time to perform, and then practicing those things. And yeah. and yeah. And then so that like that is kind of the the take home message is that anybody can perform when things are perfect. Well, you know, it's much easier to perform when things are perfect. But it's who can keep it together when the wheels are falling off or somebody does something that you know, is usually unexpected, but you know, you, you've drilled, you've trained for this sort of thing. So yeah, that, again, it, it reminds me a lot of jujitsu, man. You run into that in jujitsu all the time. You'll, someone will get you with a move and you'll be like, man, how did he do that? How did I miss that? And then you will get an answer to it and you'll drill that answer. And then they'll have an answer for that answer. And that's like, for me, that's what makes jujitsu so much fun is because the, the problems never end. You know, the, the problems for riding a bike faster, they're, you know, they're pretty well, we know what they are, right? It's, it's how, and you got to get better at them. And, and, but, you know, with jujitsu, there's so many different things all the time uh, that it, it, it definitely keeps you mentally stimulated. But it's, uh, um, yeah, so anyways, but it's fun to do two things. Like, like you are ta talking about earlier, the, the insights you get from different things. So um, I do know that you have an interview, another podcast coming up here soon. So I want to go ahead and, and uh, start wrapping this up. But um, I wanted to say that I, out of all of my, out of all of the books that you've written, um, my favorite, the, the first one, Never Let Go. I mean, that's a classic. Uh, there's just so many great things in there, but, you know, good, good workouts. So many of the workouts that you refer to still, you know, you first, uh, and, and that was a collection of articles from T Nation, wasn't it, basically? It, like well, a lot it, of them. I just wanted to make sure it all was in print. Uh, and yeah. And don't forget, that was a vanity press. That was 432 copies. That was a vanity press. Really? Yeah. And sold 17,000 so the first weekend or something. Yeah. Like yeah, yeah. That, 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 that's a classic. And then Easy Strength, I think, is a must read for, uh, for anyone, but especially if you're an older athlete, just understanding the concept well, of, don't forget, of how to get – yeah, in attempts, the whole there's a whole. I rewrite easy strength as clear as I can in attempts. Oh, okay, perfect. I, that's awesome. Even better. So you guys can get all the the newest yeah. insights Anyone and stuff. Coming back soon and just maybe spend an hour talking about easy strength. No, no, man, that'd be great. I'd love to to get you, you on and talk about that. You have to read. You have to read the rest. Yeah, and let's then let's bounce off ideas specifically for your audience but in addition let's also spend some quality time going through 
when when a program like mine or any of mine are appropriate and sometimes they're just not for example yeah. now um you know i'm gonna turn 63 in a couple days um you know i need more hypertrophy work so i need more three sets of eight with a minute rest of and you know a little bit of you know you know look you know god and guns you know uh and uh and so it's important i think for people to start to to again like i separated health fitness longevity sometimes mm -hmm. you need to go no 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 this is really appropriate here stupidest thing you can ever do there and this yeah it can help you but why don't you just go with this path which is the path that really works you yeah know? Well, listen, I do have to jump, okay? Yep, yep, yep. And uh, danjohnuniversity.com is where is the new website. You got a lot of uh, awesome stuff there. Uh, what is it? There, you're doing a special right now, right, for people? Well, yeah, please. Uh, gentle listeners, as long as we've got the virus uh, impacting us, it's $29 for three months. If Perfect. you just type in the name Corona in capitals when you sign in. It's usually $29 a month, but hey, man, when times are tough, good people help out. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Perfect. Awesome. I appreciate your time. I uh, will let you go. And uh, yeah, I'll be in touch soon. All right. Talk soon. Bye bye. Thanks, Coach. Bye.